Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today at Human Resource Executives Ask HRE Live Q&A. Today, our topic is COVID-19, leave, and ADA Ask the Legal Experts. I'm Catherine Mayer, the Senior Benefits Editor at HRE and the Chair of the Health and the Health and Benefits Leadership Conference. I'm joined today by some very bright legal minds at UNO. Very excited about this. We have Ellen McCann, Tamika Newsom, and Darius Freeman. Um, all of them are Assistant Vice Presidents of Legal Counsel at UNUM's Employment Law Group. So that makes my job easy with all of your, your titles. Thanks everyone for being here today. How are you guys? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Kathy. So we are going to dig into some really important questions about legal and compliance issues you know, all the more important and relevant, of course, with COVID-19 and how that's changing everything and really bringing those issues into the spotlight. Um, and people listening in can also ask questions. So I just wanted to let you know that you can ask questions on the comment section at the right of your screen. Um, so we'll go into those if we have time to address them as well. And without further ado, let's get it started. Um, before we dive into the different types of laws and requirements related to the pandemic, Ellen, can you give us a high level view of some of the issues that are facing employers trying to stay on top of compliance and best practices right now? Yes, Catherine. And, you know, one of the things that I reflect on every day is I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never seen anything like COVID. I don't think many of our listeners have seen anything like COVID. And there's really an increasingly complex regulatory environment that employers are working in. So they're looking at state and federal local safety requirements, reporting requirements, quarantine, isolation laws, travel restrictions for their employees, telecommuting expense issues, pay issues, um, whistleblower issues are coming up, and all of these other issues that they've never had to deal with before as they try to determine how to conduct business in the middle of a pandemic. Um, many employers who are in the non-healthcare space, for instance, are trying to decide what their vaccination policies will be like. They've never had to do that before. So there are all of these challenges, all of these issues that employers are facing. And then you layer on top of that, all of the increased leave laws that we've seen past that Derek will talk about, and the really novel and complex ADA return to work issues that Tamika is gonna to talk to us about. And it really makes for a difficult and complex regulatory environment right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously we do have these big legal changes because of COVID-19. I mean, things that we really wouldn't have thought that would have transpired. Um, and, and we have, you know, the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, which was passed earlier this year and provides paid leave for employers with less than 500 employees as a result of COVID-19. And additionally, there are states and cities have also passed laws in light of coronavirus. Um, Darius, can you go into these changes and summarize them a bit for us to talk about them? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I think it's important to remember before we even go into that, that there were already some laws in place that employers should have been thinking about when this pandemic started and as it has evolved. You had the federal FMLA and over a dozen state laws that cover just employees who are ill or caring for family members who are ill. So someone diagnosed with COVID may have fell under those existing laws. Um, you know, three states already had unpaid leave laws around quarantine or public health emergencies. And then a lot of states had, over a dozen states have paid sick or earned sick laws that covered employee and family member illnesses, but also some of those covered public health emergencies for things like school closures or business closures due to those kinds of, of situations. So we already had that framework in place. And then as you said, right, we started with the federal uh, family first Coronavirus Response Act, but it's a mouthful, FSCRA, uh, um, providing paid sick and paid FMLA for COVID-related re reasons for employers that had smaller employers under 500 lives. 
But since then, um, states like, for instance, Colorado and New York have passed new legislation that's going to be providing paid leave for COVID-related reasons uh, applicable to all employers. So not just that under 500. Most states and cities are trying to bridge the gap so that employees of any size employer have certain types of COVID-related protections. A lot of the states and municipalities have also maybe amended their existing paid sick laws or earned sick laws or, or issued clarifying FAQs. We've seen that as well uh, to ensure that COVID-related absences are covered for those employees. And again, those are applicable to all employers. Um, as far as a municipality level, I mentioned, you know, cities, counties, uh, those, especially in California, <laughs> there are over 30 different municipalities across the country that have their own laws related to COVID specific reasons, leave, pay, um, and you know, at least a third of those are brand new summer expansions upon existing laws that, that were already in place. And then lastly, not, not that that's not enough to have on our plates right now as employers, but something to think about is the fact that the state legislators are starting to get sworn in and set their agendas and priorities for 2021. And needless, needless to say, uh, in every state, COVID is at the top of that priority list, uh, along with budgets. Um, but, you know, we will probably see more as we continue to progress through the next several months. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there's so many things happening right now. And it, it is interesting when we obviously have, you know, the states um, do different things and there's the federal laws. It's a lot for employers to try to understand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, lots of challenges and, and, and things that employers are, are having to take into consideration and, and keep up with. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, obviously, like we just said, this is a lot for employers to figure out, um, you know, so for those organizations, you know, what should what should employers be doing right now to prepare for changes related to both the FFCRA for 2021? And then, of course, you know, like you mentioned, there's other people coming into office in 2021, including, of course, um, President-elect Biden. You know, he's obviously has probably some uh, COVID related leave plans. You know, any ideas on, on what Biden's plans might be? Um, and then also the FFCRA, you know, again, how can employers prepare for 2021? I think one of the ways employers have to prepare is really to stay involved and stay connected mm -hmm. to see what may be happening. So you mentioned we have we have really two different things we need to keep track of. One is what will happen with the FFCRA. And I don't think anybody knows right now, but this is really something that's changing and happening in real time. Yeah. So just yesterday, a bipartisan group of senators got together and announced that they support a COVID relief bill. We don't know what will happen with that bill, if it will even be brought forward, if it would be adopted. But what I find interesting is in that bill, there's no mention of extension of FFCRA. Now, it doesn't mean another bill won't come forward, but at least right now, the package that's getting the most support or getting the most press doesn't have anything in it to extend FFCRA. So, of course, employers who are subject to that, you want to make sure you're keeping an eye on that very closely because you could have an 11th hour uh, savior come through and, and maybe yeah. extend that into 2021. But for all employers, including those that are too large to be covered by FFCRA, you really want to get familiar with what President-elect Biden's paid leave plans are, at least right now. I mean, he has a very detailed COVID relief plan that's on his website that does provide for paid leave for employees who are suffering from COVID, <clears throat> taking care of a family member, or they have a quarantine related event or a school closure. And his plan provides for 100% of employee pay up to a certain cap. And that would be funded by a federal fund, according to his plan. So employers really want to keep an eye on that and go out if they haven't looked, go out and make yourself educated on that plan. In addition to his COVID paid leave plan, he also stated throughout the, um, the, the um, nomination cycle that he supports two other paid leave programs at the federal level. One is the Family Act, which uh -huh. would provide for partial pay during 12 weeks of FMLA covered leave reasons, and the Healthy Families Act 
which would provide employees with seven days of paid sick leave for issues relating to their own health or their family members' health or domestic violence. So he has a very robust approach to paid leave. Um, it's, you know, we don't know exactly what he'll be able to get passed in those different types of topics, but it really is important for employers to go out there, get educated, take a look at his plans so that you at least have some line of sight into what may be coming in the next administration. Yeah, so that's something that they should think about right now. Yes, absolutely. You want to, and, and again, we don't know what will actually get passed or what he'll be able to do, but at least it'll give you a line of sight on what his administration has as a priority and what they'll be working towards as they enter office. Yeah, and, and you know, we've obviously talked about having some of these laws and changes as far as federal federal leave um, for a while now, and if this does, you know, transpire in the next year. You know, what do you think employers are, are are thinking about that? Is that is that good news? Is that bad news? Is it um, complicated? I'm sure for for some of them, maybe. I think it depends on the employer, honestly, and in, in what their current philosophy is, what their resources are, how hard COVID has hit them, what industry they're in. I, I think there's really a mix of philosophies out there towards paid leave. One of the things that I think we've seen in, in our clients and folks we've talked to is many employers felt as if when COVID hit, their leave policies were not robust enough and they yeah. were not nimble enough. And so even employers with really good policies knew there were gaps. And a lot of employers have taken time this year to add to their policies, expand them. They feel as if they're in a better place, but they've also importantly seen the need their employees have for paid leave and for some protection. So I think a lot of employers might have changed over the last you know, nine, 10 months over the value of paid leave, but there are a lot of employers who honestly, they've had a hard time keeping the doors open and yeah. staying in business. And so they th look at this and say, although we would love to give our employees more paid leave, we might not be able to afford it. And so there's just really two two schools of thoughts, I think, here. And I know, Darius, to me, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on that as well as you talk to customers and, and clients as well about what their struggles are. Yeah, I think you summarized it well, Ellen. It, it, that's exactly it. I think for our larger, more stable clients, right, they're looking at how do we expand our, our existing leads leave programs, wanting to provide paid leave where appropriate without going overboard. But yeah, those smaller clients are really struggling to keep the doors open um, where they may not have as much coming in because of the pandemic, right, from a, a budgetary perspective. And then they're also trying to provide leave to their employees that, that may have you know, issues for themselves or family members. So it's, it's definitely a challenge. And I think the industry matters, the size matters the state matters, right? You know, a place like California, they've got a whole lot of different challenges maybe than they would have uh, somewhere in the Midwest, so. I think that's absolutely true as well. There's a lot of compassion, which has been mm -hmm. encouraging to see um, on, the, on the side of the employers. Everyone wants to do the right thing and wants to do right by the employees, but they've got businesses to run. And so yeah. all of the considerations get compacted with everything Ellen and Derek just mentioned. Yeah, those are great insights. It's been really interesting to to cover the industry and you know talk to talk to employers and HR leaders, which I do a lot, and and hear about what they are doing, even you know aside from even the laws. And I love what you just said, Tamika, too, about the mm -hmm. piece of this. It is such, you know, it is so important right now. I mean, more than we've ever seen before. Um, you know, I think that there is that that empathy, that compassion piece that you know maybe we hadn't seen as much in the past. Um, and leave is certainly a, a big, big part of that as far as, you know, people getting sick or taking care of their kids or, you know, their parents um, or themselves. So it's it's really fascinating to see kind of, you know, what we're seeing right now. Um, and, and Tamika, I think next next question to go back into some of those, you know, the legal side, the compliance side. Um, can we talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act or, you know, the ADA or other uh, accommodation type laws. You know, what do those laws require and what kind of guidance are we seeing from agencies like the EEOC? Definitely. You know, as if there weren't enough out there, you know, with FMLA, FFPRA, yeah. 
We also have to add the ADA, you know, all these acronyms that employers are trying to figure out how to navigate. I think the, the, the main thing to remember about the Americans with Disabilities Act is that it hasn't been changed. There's nothing that's new or different in the actual regulation themselves. But what the EEOC has done is they've probably provided us more guidance than any other federal agency about how to deal specifically with this pandemic and, and with, the, with the return to work and employment issues that are happening uh, concurrent with this. So the EEOC has done great. They've interpreted the ADA. They haven't changed it. They've just interpreted it for employers to let them know some basic questions about what you can do in terms of employment testing. You know, before the pandemic, there was we weren't allowed to take medical tests for employees and, and temperatures and report you know, medical information to other agencies. but the EEOC made it very clear that this pandemic would be a direct threat, which is a concept that's always been written into the ADA. But when there's a direct threat to the workplace, there's certain things that employers can do that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. And uh -huh. so that is one of the things that the EEOC has done. They've done a great job of letting us know what kind of changes we can make in the workplace that they believe would um, be consistent with uh, the ADA. Another area that, you know, we had no idea what to do with that the EEOC cleared up for us was what to do with people who have these uh, underlying conditions or you know pre-existing conditions that make them more susceptible to COVID who don't want to come to the workplace. But technically, a lot of them didn't fall under the ADA's standard definition of disability that would be covered. But the EEOC put out guidelines very early on that said, if you can accommodate these individuals in the workplace or outside of the workplace, we recommend that you do so. And this is just guidance that's helped employers throughout the process. They've updated their guidance probably, I think it was four times now, as wow. late as November, um, to let us know as we're, as the changes are happening, as now people are returning to work, You know, what, what should you do to prepare for people to come back to work? Another issue that's come up quite frequently is if we did make telework accommodations for people during the pandemic, do we have to keep the telework accommodations or can we make changes yeah. to that? You know, and so the EOC put out guidelines saying, you know, if the person can't fulfill all of their essential functions at home, you don't have to allow them to continue to telework. But they've given employers throughout this process a lot of guidance about how to go about navigating these employment wa waters. So I think kudos you know, to the EEOC, they've done a great job with that part of the process. It gets more difficult when we talk about state accommodation issues and, and, and laws because in the you know process, we've got lots of states that have been also enacting, and I won't say laws because a lot of these come out in the forms of governor proclamations or other local type um, legislation, but ultimately employers have to stay on top of that as well and make sure that they're following whatever guidelines that their states are providing. So it's it's been a, uh, a massive uh, endeavor to keep up with all of the different types of regulations that are out there and how to navigate the waters. But from my perspective, the ADA and the EEOC have been the most consistent in providing advice and feedback about what to do and how to stay on top of it from an ADA perspective. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's some great insight. Um, and you kind of touched on this. What about return to work uh, specifically? Um, that's obviously this really big piece that we're seeing. People are really trying to kind of figure out what best to do. Um, so what are the requirements and do you have any ideas on best practices on how to practically do this? Because that seems like a really big animal um, for employers right now. It is. It's tricky, right? And timing is tricky because you, just as soon as you think you're, we're kind of good to come back, then we have a resurgence and you kind of question, oh, what are we doing? Should Does this make sense? And every workplace is different. You know, the, the one basic guideline that I tell everybody is just make sure you're following OSHA and CDC guidelines as closely as you can, because that's just the best start. But there yeah. are other practicalities that are just going to depend on the workplace and the environment. And you know, I'd love for Ellen to kind of go into some of the things that we've done as, at, at Unum and some general principles, because I think she has a great perspective on that. Great. 
Right. And I think, Tamika, we, that exactly, that situation you just described happened to us at Unum, like many other employers. We, you know, sent everyone home virtually overnight, and we have close to 11,000 employees. And then we started working on what we called our reunite plan. So getting some people back in the office safely um, and securely with social distancing and all of the other CDC required protocols. And we actually communicated to our employees that we wanted people managers um, and above to come in at least a couple of days a week. Um, but then we just saw everywhere across the country, the virus just started to spread even more. And we saw an increase in states that hadn't really had much exposure, such as Maine, where we have a very large location. And I give our senior leaders a lot of credit. They looked at that and said, maybe this isn't the right time. So even though we had already rolled that out, a lot of work had gone into it. They took account what the national and the local landscape was for the virus and said, no, employees, no one has to come back in. It's, it's your choice. Um, but at the same time, we're, we have cross-functional teams that meet every single day to look at this from a variety of different angles to make sure we're not only compliant, but that we're providing a safe environment for our employees. And so that people who do want to come in the office and work can feel comfortable and we know we're protecting them. Uh, so there's just, you have to be nimble. You have to be cross-disciplinary. You really have to not be married to your plan and be willing and able to move as this virus moves because none of us, again, have ever seen anything like this. Hopefully we'll never see anything like this again in our careers. Um, and even the CDC has had to change their guidance along the way because this was so new. And so staying on top of that and being willing to respond, I think has been a key to at least our success as an employer in how we have handled this and how we've continued to be able to do business during this pandemic. That's great. That's great to see. I think, yeah, being nimble is such a big lesson that I've been hearing a lot about too from, uh, you know, from people in the industry is just really, you know, and also just kind of sympathizing and understanding what employer, what employees, excuse me, would like to, you know, if they want to come back in the office or if they, if they don't, um, cause it's just, it's just a very obviously, um, unpredictable, <laughs> unpredictable time. Um, speaking of, being nimble and um, you know understanding some some of the pain points, we had an audience question, which is, um, if someone is out sick because they believe they have COVID, um, but the test comes back negative and they've been out of work for over a week, what point does FMLA kick in? So many so really interesting logistics right now. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think you know the question that says they were out sick. So so I think the first step is to figure out even though they tested negative from a COVID perspective, did they actually have some kind of illness, even if it wasn't COVID related, right? Because the FMLA threshold issue for the federal FMLA is that they have to have an illness, injury, or some kind of mental or physical condition, right? So if they weren't sick at all, you have no FMLA component to think about. If they did actually have some illness, just not COVID, then it's a matter of getting the appropriate documentation from a, a physician. And I know, especially during the early stages of the pandemic, that was a challenge. So, you, you know, maybe telehealth saying, you know, if that test came back negative, did they at least document or validate some kind of illness that that employee had? So, you know, it's, it's a matter of applying the standard FMLA provisions and, and requirements. But I think the other piece of this is some of these COVID laws do provide for paid leave for employees who have been um, ordered isn't the right word, but um, you know, a healthcare provider or even their employers have asked them to self quarantine because they may be, uh, maybe they were exposed to COVID or they have symptoms that are COVID related. And so even if the test comes back negative, that kind of precautionary quarantine while they get a test is covered under a lot of these state COVID related laws. So, so FMLA is one piece, but it, employers are going to have to look across the board to see if there's something else in play for them, even if that employee had no illness at all, but was precautionarily quarantining until they had a negative result. This raises another question. I, I, I think I'd like to just point out for 
uh, that a lot of employers really do think that FMLA and or ADA coverage mm -hmm. are linked to a positive COVID test. And that's a, that's, not, uh, that's a misconception because a positive COVID test doesn't necessarily mean you're sick or you're disabled. We, yeah. we all know that there are people who have no symptoms at all um, and, and are still positive. So that's something I would like to just take out of people's thought process because it, if you start with the notion is this person sick, then you can answer FMLA and ADA type questions. Like, like Dara said, there are still other regulations that may apply that allow people to have leave or, or pay, but it, it might not necessarily lie within the FMLA or the ADA. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Um, I think, yeah, again, I think it's just something that's just been so unprecedented where that's something that a lot of people would assume. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd clear that up. Um, another good question, I think, um, and one that's that helps kind of wrap things up a little bit for us is is how can employers stay on top of all these? <laughs> Obviously, we just kind of went in went over the acronym SOUP, um, ADA, FMLA. Um, you know, so what can they do? Um, I wish there were a really nice, easy answer to this, and I wish someone had this global consolidated database that we could all go to and use and, you know, push the magic, you know, the, the easy button. Uh, unfortunately, there's not an easy button on this one, as Ellen and Tamika can attest to, uh, you, you know, you're pulling from a lot of sources right now to stay up to date. So there are some law firms out there, some really good employment specific law that specialize in employment law that are doing a couple of things. Some of them have published COVID related guides that list all the laws that have passed so far. I cannot promise you that they are all exactly up to date as of today, right? So, but it's a good place to start to see what may be out there. Um, those law firms also do email alerts related to COVID, so get on their mailing list, right? Get on, <laughs> Tamika and Ellen and I can attest, right? We get an email box full every day from all these different law firms, and a lot of them may overlap, but then sometimes based on where those law firms are situated or where they have large offices, you may get some information specific to a jurisdiction that you won't get from another firm. So those are good places to start. Uh, also, always check your state and local government websites. I think everybody has a COVID specific page now. So look there when you've got a specific issue with an employee to see is there something required in that particular jurisdiction based on the circumstance. And, and lastly, you know, at a, at a federal level, the Department of Labor for purposes of the FFCRA, the EEOC for purposes of the ADA, and yes, I think I threw in like four acronyms in one sentence. Um, <laughs> uh, they all have really good, robust websites with FAQs and, you know, scenario situations that can help guide employers. So those are really good from a federal perspective. And the only other thing I would say is be, I don't want to say open-minded, but anything employment law related may touch this right now. So for instance, um, don't get so focused on leave um, and looking for a quote leave law that you didn't notice that um, California passed, you know, some OSHA guidance that actually embedded some leave provisions in it, right? So you're going to have to take a really broad brush as you filter the information coming out uh, on employment laws to make sure that you're capturing everything that may have passed or guidance that may have been issued. And to Mika's point, sometimes it's an executive order or a you know, governor's statement. I mean, it's just, it's coming from all over. So it's really getting on mailing lists, you know, and, and finding the resources for your jurisdictions. And I don't know, Tamika or Ellen, if you have anything else to add, I know we're, we're all plugging in where we can. I would say just one other thing is make sure you're going back to your sources as yeah. well. I mean, one of the things I've been doing for Unum is helping support our, all of our quarantine for our employees, our contact tracing, all of that. And I actually have in my calendar twice a week to check the CDC website and meet with my HR partners because you don't always get an alert when the CDC makes a change. Sometimes you do. If it's a big change, you'll get an alert. Sometimes it's just a minor change and you have to know what that says and you have to be up to date. So put alerts in your calendar for the most simple things. 
just to make sure you don't lose sight of something as simple of what what is what are the most common and current symptoms of COVID. Right. That has changed many times over. Uh, the course of this, what are the quarantine recommendations? Make sure you know what they are and don't assume because you looked last week, you yeah. know what they are. You're going to have to look again because they're changing so quickly. Absolutely. Um, I think we're at about time, but we're going to sneak in one final audience question that we got, which is, do you anticipate companies providing an increased number of sick days in 2021? That is an interesting question. Any insight there? Well, Ellen, I'm probably going to ask you to answer that just because I know supporting Unum HR, we're looking at our own policies and how, you know, and, and working with other employers from a best practice perspective. All right. I, I think we, you know, we've, we've done a few surveys as well here. Oh, getting my hand the wrong way. Um, surveys of our clients as well. I can't figure it out because I'm backwards on the thing. Um, anyway, so we have, <laughs> this is good for a live stream. Um, and, and what we're hearing from them and what we're seeing in the surveys is that employers are anticipating that they will go ahead and increase those numbers for next year. Yeah, I think that um, the fact that a lot of people were off work for long periods of time and, and no longer qualify for FMLA because they didn't meet the 1250 hour requirement is making employers consider adding sick days just to, again, be compassionate and make sure that there's plenty of time so that people can take care of themselves and their families. Yeah, good point, Tamika, that, that FMLA issue, it's coming up a lot. Mm -hmm. Great, and I think, again, we are at about time, but thank you all so much for these wonderful insights. I know it was helpful to me and obviously to everyone listening in. Um, and I do wanna mention that Unum and HRE actually does have a webinar coming up on December 10th, which is called Building a Leave and Absence Strategy for the Future. So obviously that goes in perfectly with what we just discussed today. Um, so for anyone want, wanting to check that out, we definitely encourage you to do so. Um, and again, thank you to, to all of you on the panel. Um, this has been great. And thanks to everyone also who tuned in and watched this afternoon. We hope that you certainly stay safe and we will see you next time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks.